Good day, grade twelves. So, for this final push, uh, we decided to do things a little bit differently. So the concept that we're looking at, and this will be a introduction to legislation. So we're not necessarily going to focus on the content of the work, but we are going to look at what is it and why is it there? What is the, the idea behind legislation? So we're looking at an introduction to legislation. Just to recap exactly what the situation is and how does this work. So when we look at legislation, then these, this is the idea that we're working with. So we're looking at how does legislation influence the business. So to start off with, legislation is there and we're looking at rectifying the inequalities. So that means the things that in the past was not equal. So the inequalities literally means that was not equal. So that is what we're focusing on. So moving forward, legislation is then something that is seen as a challenge. A challenge because it is not easy. The idea behind legislation is then for transformation. So that means to make changes, to change things for the better. That's the idea behind legislation. So it looks at changing things the only problem is, and the reason why it is a change, a lot of people do not like change. And that is the biggest issue that we have with legislation or transformation for that purposes. So that means the difficult thing behind this is that transformation is a long and difficult process. And that is why legislation is then seen as a challenge. So legislation can only transform. And this is the, the key idea. Transformation can only happen when it reaches the workplace. So that means in businesses, and this is where there are employers, and employees. That's where transformation needs to happen. So the importance of transformation is all about the inequalities in the past. So that means what was not equal. So that means we're looking at affirmative action. Now, affirmative action focuses on changing and making better, making equal. So affirmative action focuses then on diversity in the workplace within fairness. And then there's a lot of abbreviations in legislation, which you are then going to need to know. So legislation is there to transform the workplace. So that means to rectify problems that has existed. The way in which this is done is then by means of these particular acts. So as an introduction, we look at what these acts are. So skills, we focus on things that people can do. So the things that you learn, the skills that people have, things that people can do. So development means we are improving those skills. And this is the focus of the Skills Development Act, the improvement of skills. The one thing that you need to understand is when we talk about skills development and specifically the Skills Development Act, it focuses on the development of skills in 
the workplace. Because we look at people in a business. So the workplace being, you look at improving your employee skills. And that's the, the biggest thing that you must understand. The fact that you focus on the employee skills, not random skills. Because if the, skills de- if the business does skills development in the community, it is corporate social investment. If we look at the next one, Labor Relations Act. Now, Labor Relations Act is purely there and it focuses on the relationship between the employer and the employee. So that means it focuses on how does the work People inside the workplace come together. How do they work together? What is the relationship between the employer and the employee? So the person that owns the business and the people that work for them. That act governs that relationship. So how do they get along? When you look at employment equity, employment equity is all about equal opportunity and that is what you need to understand the equal opportunity with regards to the workplace then you've got the basic conditions of employment act the basic conditions of employment act is literally the minimum requirements so the minimum requirements with regards to hours with regards to leave so what is the minimum requirements that a person must adhere to when they are employed compensation for occupational injuries and diseases act so therefore number five the one we're looking at compensation means payment so payment with regards to being paid for something that happened in the workplace. So occupational must then be something in the workplace. Injuries and diseases is then something that makes you ill or does make you feel unwell or diseases or injuries when you lose an arm. Diseases is when you get ill because of the work you do. If all of the precautions were followed, if you did exactly what you are supposed to be doing, then you look at Occupational Injuries and Diseases Act. Then we look at broad-based black economic empowerment. This focuses on previously disadvantaged people. So previously disadvantaged people with regards to management and a certain percentage of ownership. This is what that focuses on. The South African Qualifications Authority, the Qualifications Authority literally means degrees. So what people get, the skills. So that means the degrees, the diplomas, the certificates that is issued in South Africa. They set that particular standards. So they focus on the skills and they focus on the standards of that. Then we've got the National Credit Act. The National Credit Act is when you buy now and pay later. So credit means someone is owed. That's what credit then means. So this act focuses on only that. The Consumer Protection Act. 
So therefore the consumer is someone that buys a product and this act then protects everyone that buys a particular product. So then, if we look at legislation as a whole and we start looking at what must you know, then you get these concepts under each one of those. So if you look at the concepts, then if you look at purpose, they will ask you what is the purpose of a particular act. This is then you ask yourself the question, why? So that means you focus on why was that act written? So why is it there? You can also then ask yourself, what will it change? So therefore, it was instituted for changing a particular thing, for addressing a particular issue. So that means the issue that that act was written specifically for. If you look at impact and they ask you for impact of the act on businesses, then you can look at the positive impact or you can look at negative impact. So the negative impact and the positive impact will then be the advantages and the disadvantages. So you will then say the act, this, the, the, the impact of the act, the effect, and that is what it is. So because of this act, what must the business do or what must the business not do? So what is the effect of that particular thing. When you look at discriminatory action is not following the act. So discriminating either because or because of the act. Penalties is then a penalty that you need to Pay. So therefore, you can get a fine or for some of the acts, you can get a closure notice. So this is penalty. So negative things that will happen for not following or implementing. Let's go with implementing is a better word for not implementing the act and then when you look at compliance compliance means following the act so you implement the act in the business that is what that then means. So if they ask you for the purpose, they ask you for the impact, then you need to say, why is the act there? What will it change? What issue is it addressing? When you look at impact, you look at positive or negative. So what must the business now do because of the act? What does the business now not do? Or what can the business not do? So not do because of the act. And then you look at discriminatory action. So how can the business discriminate against people, against other businesses under this act? Penalties would be fines and clo closure notices and things like that. So negative for not implementing the act. So punishment almost. Let's go with that. So that's almost like a punishment the business gets if not following the act. And then compliance means you are following the act. What must you do? What does the act say the business must do? That is when you look at compliance. 
So what must you know under each one of these acts? So you will need to know the purpose. Now, as we just said, the purpose is, why is that act there? And this will be for all the acts, for all nine of the acts that you are supposed to know. Specific things when you look at acts is the rights that you have under Labor Relations Act. Now, this would be the rights of the employer as well as the rights of the employee. So that means you need to focus on both of the rights that you have. So what is the rights of the employees? What is the rights of the employers? You also, when you look at rights, you will have rights under the Consumer Protection Act. And for the Consumer Protection Act, you will have the rights of the consumers. As well as under the National Credit Act, you will have the rights of consumers. So rights is an important thing that you need to look at. So then you've got the Human Resource Development Strategy as well as the National Skills Development Strategy, which then falls under the Skills Development Act. So that means you need to know what those two strategies are. So therefore you look at sector education and training authorities, and that's what the CETA then stands for. So that means you must know what is it and what do they do. So that is the questions that you need to be able to answer. When you look at impact for each act, so that means what is the positive as well as the negative impact of the act. Then if you look at triple B double E, you look at the pillars and therefore you need to know what the five pillars of BEE are. Then you need to know compliance, we've done, penalties we've looked at, and discriminatory actions we have looked at. So to finish off this particular section, we look at key concepts that comes in under legislation. So that means affirmative action, which is policies and processes, providing a preference in employment opportunities and this focuses on previously disadvantaged people. So affirmative action then falls under triple B, double E. I'll just change the color. So that means you need to know that there is a preference for previously disadvantaged people. Bargaining councils is where the negotiation happens between the trade union representatives and the employer organizations. This is, will be on a labor-related issue, and this is where there's a demand for higher wages or there's a problem with the working conditions. Then your bargaining councils will then fall under your Labor Relations Act. Then you've got your triple B, double E scorecard. So the scorecard focuses on the pillars, and this measures compliance with triple B, double E, according to the scorecard, which is then stipulated in a BEE rating. So that means it tells you how compliant is this business. Collective agreement is then when everyone, collective meaning everyone, is in agreement. So that means the trade union and the employer organization is on the same page. Collective bargaining would then mean everyone negotiates. So bargaining would be negotiations. We move on and we look at compensation fund. So that falls under COIDA. Credit providers would then be the people providing and this is where they provide goods and services on credit 
So that would fall under National Credit Act. Debt counselors is someone that helps someone that is in debt and is now over indebted. So that means they have too much debt. So that would also be your National Credit Act. Discrimination will be part of most acts. So therefore, we also look at the Employment Equity Act. Then disputes would normally be with regards to your employment. That would be under the Labor Relations Act. You would look at your employment contract, which is a binding agreement between the employer and the employee. Also, Labor Relations Act. Equity, we look at fair treatment. And one of the main acts there is employment equity. Then the last set of ones, we look at learnerships, is where people then train in opportunities. This is then also under your Labor Relations Act. I'm, I'm talking nonsense, your Skills Development Act. Then your levies would fall under Skills Development Act. So that means the one percentage lockout is part of industrial action. So that means we the business owners lock people out. Your NCR is your National Credit Regulator and this falls under your National Credit Act. So therefore, protecting either the, the, the credit providers or the consumers. The Ombudsman is someone that investigates complaints. CETAs are sector and educational training authorities. So they are the ones that creates learnerships internships, apprenticeships, and they adjudicate this. So that means they make sure that it works. Strike, by now you know exactly what a strike is, and then it gives you a proper definition of what workplace injuries are. <coughs> so these are the concepts under legislation that you will have to know very clearly in order to move on when it comes to legislation. So uh, we're looking at the legislation. So we're focusing on each act individually, just to give you a nutshell version of each one of the acts. Remember, use a little bit of common sense when you talk about the acts or when they ask you about the acts. Remember that the name of the act says what it is. The name of the act says what it does. And the name of the act kind of explains to you what it is is there for. So when you move on and we start looking at each one of individual acts, skills deployment, our skills deployment, skills development focuses on quality of the education. But the reason why it is a piece of legislation and it was implemented in businesses, in places of work, is because it focuses on the quality of education, but specifically in the workplace. Remember that. You must remember that. If it's not in the workplace, um, then you need to know that it is definitely not part of skills development. So that means you focus on your corporate social investment. But in the workplace, it focuses on skills development. The reason why this act was implemented, first of all, is to create standards. And that would then be specifically for sectors or specific industries. So it is setting industry standards to make sure that everyone with a certain qualification or a certain skill can do something specific. If you now improve the skills of your employees, that means they become more productive. The follow, fallout of that is if they are more productive, that means they work more efficiently. And if they work more efficiently, that means the business becomes more profitable. So that means it's a good thing for your business. It increases the skilled workers which is then a good thing because this helps with the efficiency and the profitability of the business. And also a good thing that comes out of this is the employees feel more valued 
So the negatives or the negative impact, remember your positives would be impact as well as your um, negatives. They talk about impact, advantages or disadvantages. So the business must pay the 1%, that would be your skills development levy. And small businesses will find it difficult to give workers time off for training. Remember, this is specifically aimed at large businesses. This, what we are looking at for impact, is focused on large businesses. If you have a small business and there's only two people working front of the business, then it's difficult to give all of them off. If you take Checkers, for instance, which is a large business, there's a lot of tills, there's a lot of people operating the tills. They can do the skills development. They can do the training and take people away from the till specifically. So it is a challenge for small businesses to then actually give people off and do the specific training. So in order to comply with the Skills Development Act, the employers or the businesses must register with CETAS. CETAS, remember, is your sector education and training authorities and they look after the specific training that happens in each one of the industries. So the penalties that can follow is any person convicted of a fraudulent offence may be sentenced to a fine or imprisonment or they can actually stop them from operating. So in order for the business to discriminate against these particular, this particular act would mean that they look at unfair development of skills or they restrict certain employees from not actually doing this. So the next one, Labor Relations Act. Remember, Labor Relations Act is the relationship between the employer and the employee. So you're looking at how do they get together, how do they work together, and what are they focusing on. So the relationship between these two. This is what labor relations is all about. You get parties involved there, remember? So you look at your trade unions and your employer organizations that does get involved. And then you look at collective bargaining where all of them look at payment and or remuneration and um, working conditions. So the framework so it says what can be done and what can't be done. That's what the word framework means. What must be done. That is the focus of the framework. So what must be done between your employer and your employee? What can happen? What should happen? So it looks at that relationship. It promotes a healthy relationship between your employers and employees because it gives the employees the grievance procedure. So that means if there is grievances, they can speak up. So that is part of the Labor Relations Act. Then it promotes orderly collective bargaining. Now collective bargaining, collective means everyone together. Bargaining is negotiations. So that means they look at how can the employer and the employee work together, negotiate collectively together, and that would then resolve the disputes or the grievances that does exist in the business. The negative impact of this is the cost of labor increases because of strikes. Strikes is something that is a right of employees by means of the Labor Relations Act. There is a process that needs to be followed, so they can't just rock up at work one morning and decide, today we are striking. There is a process that must be followed, so that is an important part that you need to remember. And then it reduces global competitiveness. Now, why does it reduce global competitive? Global meaning the world. So why does it make us less competitive in the world and why does it lower productivity in the business? Because work stands still. So work stands still and the business is not making anything or selling anything and that is the biggest problem.
and that's why it influences global competitiveness. Then employers must allow the formation of workplace forums. Now the workplace forum is then an in inverted commas a internal um, trade union but it's not a trade union I repeat workplace forum is not a trade union workplace forum looks after mostly working conditions they cannot and I will repeat that they cannot intervene when it comes to remuneration then the financial costs is very hefty fines when it comes to um, improper implementation of the Labor Relations Act. So there's fines from the CCMA, the Commission for Conciliation, Mediation and Arbitration, and then discriminatory actions means the employee employer does not um, grant the employees um, union representation. So that means they don't allow unions on the premises or to exist there. Then if you look at employment equity, equity is all about um, equal, remember, so that you look at fair treatment, equal opportunity in the workplace. So it, it promotes, that's the positive impact that happens when the Employment Equity Act is implemented properly. It promotes the equal opportunities and the fair treatment of all employees and it also promotes diversity. Now diversity we all know is differences. So the different cultures, it looks at cultures, it looks at um, races, it looks at different genders. So when it becomes diversity or when it becomes a diverse workplace, it focuses on having representation of all of those different, different people in the business. So the negative impact when it comes to employment equity is you need to submit employment equity reports every two years. So there is administration with regards to this particular act. And then also businesses must train or employ someone that knows a lot about the act. So they need to employ a specialist do implement this act specifically and focus on how they can work with equal treatment in the business. Employers must promote equal opportunities. So when they advertise positions, when they do promotions, every person, regardless of what their status is, their culture is, their race is, their gender is, every person must then get a equal opportunity and that is what employment equity is all about it's about the equal treatment the equal opportunities for all employees in the business so remember all of these acts are specific for businesses and implemented inside the businesses so if an employer is found guilty they can be fined or ordered to pay compensation to the employees that was treated unfairly then refusing an employee because of religious beliefs, that would be the discriminatory action that a business can do. Basic conditions of employment, we've established that your basic conditions of employment is the minimum requirements. that must exist, the minimum hours, the minimum things. So that means it creates a framework for acceptable employment practices. So it looks after the employees and it makes sure to provide that the business cannot take for granted the employees that works for them. It promotes fair treatment of employees in the business because of everyone now works the same hours everyone does the same work so that is the focus of and that's why they use fair treatment here as well the negatives would then be the processes and procedures for basic conditions can be very costly and very um, tedious so you need to look at 
what are these processes and procedures? So what is the minimum hours? What is the leave? What is all of the minimum standards that a person must work according to the minimum wage, the wages that must be paid. So that means it can limit operations because now we're looking at things like overtime. People can only work a certain amount of overtime, so therefore you need to then employ more employees. You need to get more people working for the business in order to not be limited by this particular act. So the, for the compliance, an employer must give workers information about their job and their job description and the working conditions and the important part here is it must be in writing and that would then be your employment contract. So that is what you need to look at, the employment contract that there is. The business could be fined and legal action could be taken and this is then done through the labor court. Remember that the CCMA focuses on the basic conditions of Employment Act so that means and, and the Labor Relations Act so that means it focuses on this and this will happen in labor court so this is not a civil um, lawsuit that then happens. Then discriminatory actions with regards to basic conditions of employment is preventing workers having access to their employment contracts. So telling them they can't know what their contract says or they don't have a copy of their contract or they don't know what the conditions is that they work under. Compensation for occupational injuries and diseases. Now this is focusing on payment where there is either an injury or disease because of the work that they did. So it focuses on that. So therefore the Compensation for Occupational Injuries and Diseases Act, or COIDA, focuses on the protection of the employees if something should happen, so injured or killed on a contract. So that means work that they are doing. So this act promotes the safety in the workplace and it also then sets a process in place where people can claim and that claim would then be for the payment according to the act so focusing on what that is implementation so that means it can be tedious and it can be expensive because there's a lot of red tape with regards to this it's a very bureaucratic process especially the claiming process because people the, the, the people need to make sure that it's not a fraudulent claim so focusing on this there's definitely a very big admin load when it comes to this particular act compliance the business must then register with the commissioner of the compensation fund before anything of this can happen so if the business is not registered they so if they are not registered that means they cannot claim so that means there's no claims that can happen and that is then non-compliance or discriminatory if the business isn't registered however if the business now wants the employee not to claim so they don't want to report the injury they don't want the employee to be claimed that is also a discriminatory action and there is definitely fines when it comes to this so that means the employer for not notifying the commission within the specific specified time so there's a specific time that you need to be um, reporting the incidents in so broad-based black economic empowerment focuses on inequality it is try to fix the inequality in South Africa remember all of these acts are based in South Africa and it does not affect the international scene so it's not anywhere else in the world so it aims at targeting the inequality that happens and this is done through um, improving um, employment and management and ownership of previously disadvantaged people under this particular act. So the positives of this is it improves the image of the business, it develops the employee's 
potential so therefore it looks at the skills and its boosts staff morale because staff are now more valued or put in um, positions of management and also given the opportunity of ownership so that means it is something that improves the overall morale of employees so many businesses um, don't have a BEE rating so that means they are not compliant and they are not looking at the pillars of BEE. Investment in ownership can now cause animosity because people have biases with regards to race and gender and color and that can be an issue. So compliance, when the business complies you look at um, preferential procurement so where do the businesses buy their resources so that means where do they purchase the things that they need so that's one of the things that you can look with the BE standards companies that do not comply can be prosecuted and fined and that can then end up in court so refusing to award tenders to black suppliers who are BEE compliant is then a discriminatory action that can go against this particular act. So the National Credit Act focuses on credit and this you must remember. It focuses on credit so at the point of transaction there is no money that happens. So there is no money exchange. It is a pay later situation so that means you do it on account so that is what the credit act focuses on so it promotes the social as well as the financial interest of the business because credit providers cannot take advantage of consumers when it comes to interest rates or those type of things the positives about this is it prevents reckless lending so that means businesses can't give everyone everything they want they focus on what the consumer can afford so they look at affordability which is a very big help so then people can't be over indebted so that means there's credit agreements and the credit agreements must be easy to read and easy to understand so the negative about this is it extend the administrative capacity so that means there will have to be people appointed specialist when it comes to um, setting up the agreements and also then recovering the debt because you can't just blacklist someone there's a whole process that needs to be gone through so businesses need to have someone in charge of all of the credit in this particular business so the credit providers must do an affordability assessment that's how they can then comply with this particular act so check um, check the consumer, they check their income, they check their expenses and then they check what do they have left, so what is their disposable um, income and then they look at can they afford that particular loan or that particular account. If yes, then credit is granted. If no, then they do not grant the credit. So businesses that does not comply will lose money and they will then also lose the money that the people owe them. So if they did not follow the process, so if there is people that does and they didn't recover the money according to the process that needs to be followed, that money is then lost. So refusing to grant credit based on gender, race, religion or age, that is um, discriminatory but if they look at the disposable income they look at the affordability and the, imp the the consumer cannot afford it then they do not grant the credit and they must provide reasons so they must be able to say why did they not grant that the Consumer Protection Act is then focusing on all consumers so everyone that walks into a business with money in their hand that can pay for something that is what the consumer protection act so that means responsible consumer behavior as well it gives the business as much rights 
as it does the consumers. So it makes it fair for both sides. So that both sides would be the business as well as the consumer. So it does not give the consumer any rights that they can do whatever they want and then expect the business to um, just do what the customer says. So that is also there to help res um, resolve disputes. Businesses that does not comply with the Act um, need to ensure that they comply with the Act so they are not penalized. It doesn't say they aren't penalized. It means they need to comply in order to penalize. And the first thing that they must look at is the safety of consumers. That is one of the big issues um, that the Consumer Protection Act focuses on. So many businesses, there's a lot of documentation to comply with this act and it makes it a admin reach act to actually then focus on. So businesses comply in terms of this and you look at the National Consumer Commission. That is who sets out these conditions that needs to be complied with. So the consequences is then fines according to CPA. So the Consumer Protection Act would then be costly to implement because businesses can be fined for improper treatment of consumers. Charging unfair prices is discriminatory, discriminatory because fair prices, f um, marketing, and also, like I said before, safety of the consumers is the main concern. So that is the act in a nutshell. We're looking at human resources and this will be the introduction to human resources. So overall, what is human resources? So to start off, the first concept you need to understand is human resources. Now, in order for a human, so that means a person, to be a resource, what is it that you need from that person? So the res what makes a person a human resource is the fact that there is skills, there is qualifications, and there is um, experience. So that is what the business is after. And then the fact that the person can work. That is the one big thing. So human resource is the person that has a specific set of skills, qualifications, experience, and that can work or perform certain tasks. That is what you are looking for. Now the human resource function on the other hand is what you then essentially need to have in a business specifically because the human resource function has the responsibility and that responsibility is to look after the employees. So that means they look after the employees, which is then your human resources. So these human resources are then looked after. But not only, what happens is people come and go at a particular business. So people stop working there. So in essence, you recruit, you train, you place, and then you keep happy put it in layman's words or in layman terms. So the human resource function is responsible for the employee. So that means if they leave, you need to get a new one. If you appoint someone, you need to give them a certain amount of training. So that means you need to place them in a position where their skills equal 
the need of the business. And then you need to keep them happy. So that means look after them specifically with regards to extra things such as benefits, remuneration, all those type of things. So that's the, the basic concept. We look at legislation. So now legislation is what you have focused on under environments in term one. So legislation focuses on the administration of the human resources. So what goes with it? Now, when it comes to the Labor Relations Act, now if you go back to term one, you will know that the Labor Relations Act is focused or governs the relationship between the employer and the employee. And then this can be influenced and then things that you need to remember is the fact that you now look at what that relationship is governed by. So you look at the framework. That's what this gives. It gives a framework specifically f between the employee and the employer. So you focus on what are allowed to happen, what can be done. So if you look at this, the human resource f function will then implement these, this, this uh, act in the business. Now one of the requirements or the the acts is states that the worker cannot be dismissed easily because of CCM processes so this would then be when you look at grievances so when there's a grievance and this grievance would then either be due to displace discipline or because there was a different issue so that means the CCMA is part of the grievance procedure. Then the human resource management must allow workers to form unions and be part of unions. That you need to un remember. And then you look at promote negotiations and employee participation in decision making. So this is what the legislation brings when it comes to human resources and the human resource function specifically. Then you look at the Employment Equity Act. Now Employment Equity Act is all about fair opportunity and this means opportunity, the same opportunity for everyone. So that means the human resource um, management manager must promote equal opportunities in the workplace and this is where set of employment equity plan is part of the implementation and it monitors the reg it regular regularly so that is the responsibility of the human resource manager so that means the human resource function must then do all this and then the big thing when it comes to employment equity is equal pay for equal work. So that means if you work, you are not allowed to pay people differently because they are different. Then skills development is all about the skills of employees and this will be then, this development will happen in the business. So that means inside the business with the employees. So mm, the human resource manager must set up training according to the Skills Development Act and then you need to identify training needs of the employees and provide them with opportunities. You can't force them to actually then do the training but you must give them the opportunity. And then you need to make sure that training in the workplace is structured. The reason why you need to structure it is 
When you then do training and you do unnecessary training, that means they will get skills that they won't need or skills that they can't use in the business and then you've spent money on something unnecessarily. Then the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. So that means it states the minimum requirements to which the contract must adhere. So that means what will the employment of the person for the business B. What is the minimum requirements? So then workers should only work and remember 9 to 5, 8 to 6. That's the combination you go to. So overtime is not allowed to be more than 10 hours a, work a, year, a, a week. Sorry, um, A break of 60 minutes after 5 hours of work. And then you need to know that 6 weeks um, sick leave in a cycle of 36 months. So that means you need to know that is a three-year period and that is a three-year running period. If we look at some key concepts, so a curriculum vitae or CV is what you send in so the candidate sends that in so the candidate sends that in sends your CV in when you apply for a position. So that is one thing. Employment contract is a legally binding agreement between the employer and the employee. And remember, this will be a written document, always a written document. Then external recruitment, when you get people to come and work from you from outside the business. Fringe benefits is benefits so extra things that gets paid to the business in addition to so that means it's extra on top of your salary or wage then induction includes the introductory training of new workers to the workplace or the organization. So that means induction is in essence basically an orientation that you put the employees through, but you don't call it orientation, you talk about induction. Internal recruitment is where you get people from inside the business, so within the business. Interview is the situation where there is a formal meeting and information is exchanged between the interviewer and the interviewee. So in <clears throat> next one tells you the interviewee is the one that answers the questions during the interview. So the interviewee is the candidate applying for a position. And the interview will then happen with representatives of the business that you applied at. Then you look at the interviewer, so that means it's a representative and this representative is the person of the business where you have applied, so that means which have a vacancy and that application happened because there was a vacancy so that means an empty job then your job analysis you must remember that your job analysis consists of your job description and your job specification so your job analysis is a tool that you use or the human resources function uses this tool to analyze and see what is the need that they do have so that they can find the right person in the right job so that you know what they are supposed to be doing and what they need to, in order to do that particular job. So job description is the duties. Remember the D. So job description describes the duties of the person and job specification is all about skills, qualifications. Then placement is where the selected candidate. So that means this is after the interview, this is once the person has been chosen for that particular position. So placement happens 
when you place that person into a specific job that will work well for the business. So that means where that person will function optimally based on the skills that they have as well as the experience that they have. Then preliminary interview is a short interview that they need to see whether people can be shortlisted or not. So that means candidates in order to determine which candidates meet the specific criteria. So that means it's a form of selecting people for interviews, further interviews. Recruitment process used by the business to identify certain vacancies. So that means when you identify a vacancy, recruitment is attracting candidates. So... <clears throat> And remember, you want to attract suitable candidates. The selection is where you then choose a particular person. So that means you choose a qualified candidate for this particular post, which then adhere to the requirements of the job analysis. So that means they can perform the duties that you want them to, and they have got the right skills or qualifications according to preset standards that you decided on. So then the process that you need to follow is appointing that particular person. So that means the selection process is where you choose someone until you appoint someone in that specific position. So to start human resources off, this is what human resources basically consist of. So the next one we're looking at is business strategies. Now, when you look at strategies, you need to understand the concept and how it actually works. So, strategies, let's start simple. And we start with the definition. So, if you look at the definition, definition consists out of what it is and the purpose of it. So if you look at what a strategy is, then the first idea you need to capture is a long-term plan. And there has to be action. So that means it's a long-term plan or a long-term action plan. And that is what it is. The purpose of it is to achieve your goals. So that means the idea is you want to achieve your goals. That's where we start. So when you look at strategies, then it's all about the plans. It's all about how. And it's all about what needs to be done. So what do I do to get from here to there? Now, this is generally implemented or done when the business sees challenges. So when there's challenges, all of this strategies and the strategic plan is the response businesses has towards um, challenges that the businesses see or see coming. So if you look at the strategic management process, so how does a business go about managing the challenges? So the first step in this process is you need to have a clear vision. So that means where you see the business in the future what you think the business needs to be. The next thing you look at is the mission. So that means what needs to be implemented in order to reach the vision. And then the last one would be the goals. So what is there to achieve? Or where are we going? Or the business? where the business is going. So that's the main idea when you look at this 
particular step. So that means you need to see where the business is, where your business want to be. You need to know what needs to be done in order to get to that vision. And then the goals is kind of the mile markers that you need to pass. And all of this plays along in the end to actually get to the vision of the business. If you look at the industrial analysis, now the industrial analysis consists of scanning all environments. Now, all the environments, going back to grade 10 work, we've got the micro environment, which is the business itself. It's inside the business and the business has full control and full influence. Now the tool you use in that is then your SWOT analysis. So the SWOT analysis is what you then use in order to scan the micro environment. Then we go to the market environment. Now the market environment is immediately outside the business. Management has no control or some control, but they do have influence. Now the tool you use there is you look at Porter's five forces. So Porter's five is then the tool you use to scan your market environment. Then you've got your macro environment that's completely outside the business. There's no control. There's no influence. The only thing the business can do is adapt that you need to know. And then what we use in the macro environment is the pestle analysis. So the pestle analysis is consisting of all the components, which is political, economic, social, technological, legal, and environmental. And those are the factors that you then look at for things that implement or influence your business. Now, strategies is plans. It's ideas. It's things that the business wants to do to see in the end how you can address the challenges. Now, there are certain steps. So formulating the strategies, you need to respond to challenges. So that means you need to see what can be done. So you're testing theories, basically. So when you develop a strategy, or so develop, you can look at, or formulate, you can look at develop. So that means you're coming up with ideas on how you can fix the problems. So that means formulate a strategy to address the challenge. That's the idea behind it. Now you do this by doing four things. The first thing you would do is you've now done the environmental scan. So that means you scan the business by means of environmental scanning. So when you look at environmental scanning, you look at the micro environment, the macro environment, and the market environment. So you look at what is in the business, what challenges is there. Then the second step, you formulate the strategy in order to meet objectives. So the objectives is then the smaller steps. Remember when we, we started in grade 10, we had vision, mission, goals, and objectives. Now the objectives is smaller things the business can do to actually achieve the goals. Then your third step is you look at implementing the strategies. 
So when you implement the strategies, you're basically testing your theory. You're testing to see whether this works. And these strategies are implemented by means of a action plan. So there's specific steps that needs to be done in order to. So you're testing the theory. Then the last step is now you compare. So you look at what happened. So expected results. And you compare it to what you thought was going to happen. I'm talking nonsense now. You're looking at what happened. So your actual results versus your expected results. So you need to see, did it work? Did it address the challenge? Did it solve the problem? Yes or no? So you're comparing the actual results versus the expected results. Once you've now seen what works and what not, now you develop the action plan. So this is where you now put it and you break it up into small tasks and these small tasks will be exactly what must be done and when you look at what must be done there will then obviously be people so you will assign responsibility so when you assign responsibility you make sure whoever needs to be able to do that or whoever needs to do it is then doing it. So there's definite specific things. So when it comes to evaluate, this is where you check and then you correct. So there needs to be corrective action all the time, making sure that you are addressing the issue. So that means what you've tested over here is actually solving the problem. So when you now check and when you evaluate, you first look at the basis of the strategy. So that means you understand what is the most intricate details of it. So examine the underlying basis of the business strategy. Then you look forward and backwards. So that means You've now implemented it. So that means you look back and you look forward throughout the whole process to see what happened, where did it change, what worked, what not. Then you correct. So that means you take corrective action. And if there was deviations, and this is what you're correcting, you're correcting deviations. So that means where did it go wrong? So you look at the steps, you look at where can we fix it so that the end result is better. Then the fourth step is you focus on dates. And these dates are then specifically for control measures and for follow-up measures. So that means you need to keep the process alive. And then, once you are done, you decide on the outcome. So that means, was the outcome and the objective achieved? And is that now what you specifically want? We move on and we then look at the different tools. Now, the different tools is then, remember, what you use to do the environmental scanning. Now, the environmental scanning... The SWOT analysis, hopefully by now you know. So that means the SWOT analysis, you always do strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So those are always how you do it. So if you look at opportunities, weaknesses, and threats, then this is basically the layout 
of what your SWOT analysis would look like. So always remember that opportunities and threats are external and then your weaknesses and your strengths are internal. So that means you need to understand what are you looking at and what is it that you focus on. So that means you look at what does the business do good inside strengths? What does the business do bad or can improve on inside? When you now move on and you look at opportunities, so what comes along and can make the business better? Your opportunities. And then what is something that can harm the business? So therefore your threats. So SWOT analysis, you focus on the business itself. Because remember, the SWOT analysis is basically focusing on what influences the business from outside. So even though it's the micro environment, you need to look at influences. So that means you look at what makes the business better what makes the business worse then the port is five by now you know and remember the name of the force is important so when you look at the names of the forces you've got power of suppliers so that is the influence a supplier can have on the prices what will make the supplier more powerful with regards to your business and the more powerful the supplier is obviously the less control the business have then you've got the power of buyers and remember like I said already the name of the force is important so that means if buyers buys in bulk so this is kind of the idea suppliers you look at prices power of buyers means if they buy in bulk that means they will be able to then bargain or negotiate prices then you've got the threat of substitutes now the threat of substitutes is basically the idea of what can people buy instead of my product so is there different products that consumers can replace mine with maybe for a better price maybe for better quality so what is the threat of substitute so you need to focus and you need to figure out what is my competition like in the market environment then you've got barriers to entry now barriers to entry is basically the concept of what stops other businesses from moving into this market is it expensive like factories if you want to set up a factory it is very expensive so that's a barrier so if business is selling the similar products in the existing market for the first time what stops them from entering the market then the last one we've got competitive rivalry so that means the number of competitors so here you're looking at the product people can substitute with competitive rivalry you look at the actual competitors so what is what businesses is there and their ability to control the market so that means you look at unique products so what competitive advantage do they have then your pestle analysis now by now you should be more than familiar so that means you know that it is political economic social technological and environmental and remember environmental 
you can divide into, or you under that is physical environment, and you also look at your global environment. So these are the things that you use or that you specifically look at for making sure that you scan your environments properly. So you need to be able to, let me just go back, you need to be able to um, identify challenges from each environment. So that means your macro, your market, as well as your micro. So that means you need to be able to look at scenarios. Then you also need to be able to make recommendations. So what can they do to address the challenges? So the recommendations would then be addressing the challenges, making sure that you've got something you can actually fix it with. So then we look at the different types of strategies. So the different types of strategies would then be focusing on what is the different types. Now the different types, you've got integration. So that means you make one. So you take different things, you integrate them together, you make them one. So the first one we look at is forward integration. So forward integration focuses on the business taking over the distributor. So that means you sell to yourself. Then you've got backward. So your backward integration focuses on the business taking over or merging with the supplier. So that means you buy from yourself. And then you've got horizontal. Now horizontal is then on the same level. So they take control over a business in the same industry. So that means you take over a competitor. So you stay on the same level. If you look at defensive, defensive, if you become defensive, that means you're blocking. So if you look at cricket, you block. So defensive strategies, you would look at divestment. Divestment meaning you sell assets. Or departments. And those are the ones that then is not known as not profitable anymore. So you're making divisions, you're making the business smaller. Which then equals increased profitability. Then you look at retrenchment. Now, I'm not going to go through retrenchment very specifically because retrenchment is then the terminating of employment contracts due to operational reasons. So you're not dismissing them because of, of uh, misconduct. You are retrenching them due to operational reasons. Then you've got liquidation. And this is where we use sell all lock, stock and barrel. Then you've got intensive strategies. So you've got market penetration. Now market penetration means you come in with a bang. So new products at existing market and then you do it at low prices. So the low price gets your people to come. Then you've got market development, and that's exactly what it means. So that means market development focuses on the existing products and the existing products are sold to new markets. 
So that means you're targeting new people with your existing products. And then the last one, you've got product development. So that means you develop new products. And that new product is then focused on existing markets. So that means you come up with new products. Then you've got diversification. So this is then making it broader. So you've got concentric. Now concentric diversification is focused on new products, but it is related to what you are selling currently and you are selling it to existing customers. So you're not doing too much of a new thing. Then you've got horizontal diversification. Horizontal diversification focuses on new products. So there's something new that is unrelated. So that means it's not close to what you are selling, but also to existing customers. Then the last one, you've got conglomerate. Now conglomerate, you focus on conglomerate diversification focuses on new products. You look at unrelated products and this unrelated product is then to new customers and that ladies and gents people of the palace is a quick overview of business strategies